are attending. But okay, so time is already 5.30 in Japan. Uh, John, it is 9.30 or 8.30 in the morning in UK. It's 9.30 th nine nine, in the UK. We're 30. on daylight saving time now, yes. Okay. Good, good, good morning again. And good thank morning. you for... Uh, I'd like to say, John, thank, uh, I'd like to thank John for accepting uh, to give uh, give us a very nice seminar. And also, I'd like to <clears throat> thank all the, all the participant audience uh, to attend this in, uh, Eisner uh, interest seminar. So first, I'd like to... Ah, uh, I should say my myself. I'm Matsumoto from my from Eisner, and uh, it is quite honor. I'm very honored to be the chair of the Professor John Kirner seminar today, and it is not so important, not so necessary uh, to tell tell you, but John is uh, exactly the one of the most powerful PIs in Eisner and his contribution to Eisner in the last 10 years, more than 10 years, is very great. And in addition to the contribution, um, John is also recognized an authority in the field of solid state and ionics. And for this reason, uh, John has already received uh, many awards. And Look, I looked at the abstract of John's uh, talk today, and he, John's talk seems to be about ionic conduction in solids. I don't know if it is like a lecture to students, but I'm convincing. I'm convinced that John's story is always interesting and instructive. So I think we are able to learn many things uh, from John's seminar today. So I should not spend long time. Uh, John should spend spend. So I'd like to pass the microphone to John. Okay, okay. thank you. I'll start uh, my screen share. And uh, Matsumoto, would you would you tell me that uh, when you can see this? Yes, I, right now I can see your slide in the normal mode. So yes, right now it is perfect. Okay, well, thank you, thank you very much, Hiroshi, and, and good morning to everybody in Europe, and uh, good afternoon to everybody in Japan, and I, I guess you're still in bed if you're in the States uh, watching this. So, um, my talk is going to be about optimizing ion transport in ceramics for energy conversion and storage applications. It's a bit of a wide title, but essentially I'm going to be talking about oxygen ion con conductors, uh, which I've spent most of my career in, uh, uh, looking into. So let's look at the device that we're going to we, we're, we're going to try and optimize, uh, and it's the solid oxide fuel cell and the solid oxide electrolyzer cell. We have an electrolyte, cathode, and an anode. Feed air into the cathode compartment, hydrogen or a fuel into the um, anode compartment, and we pr produce power. And of course, the optimization is about optimizing the. Uh, current, the current density of oxygen that you can get through this device. We have the exchange of oxygen up here on, on the surface of the uh, cathode, the flux of oxygen through the cathode, through the electrolyte, and to the anode where it reacts with the fuel. So it's quite an optimization uh, 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 a problem. The nice thing about this device is you can reverse it, you can put uh, renewable power in, and electrolyze things such as water and uh, CO2, and it works very well in, in reverse. Um, one of the interests, so the current interests in using these solid oxide cells is to produce green hydrogen. The advantages are that uh, we have reversibility, we can operate in fuel cell and electrolysis mode, we produce green hydrogen, that is if we use uh, renewable electricity, for um, industrial processes such as production of ammonia, steel, uh, and possibly in, in, in heavy transport. And there's a lot of interest in, 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 in this emerging now. Um, we can also use it for co-electrolysis of CO2 and, and water to produce syngas and then on to e-fuels. Um, the disadvantages are the durability of these devices operating at high temperature and the cost. Uh, 
Well, just to show you some idea of current interest, this was an announcement from last year. Haldor Topsor in Denmark are building uh, a 500 megawatt electrolyzer facility based on these solid oxide uh, uh, cells. And the Ceres Power announced last year that it's building a one megawatt class uh, solid oxide electrolyzer demonstrator, which is due to be operational. Uh, this year. So there's quite some industrial um, uh, interest in these devices. And especially as because they operate at high temperature, they can be integrated into industrial processes. So let's just have a look a little bit about the problems of looking at these cells, which are made up essentially of three layers of ceramic. Here's our, again our electrolyte, our cathode and our anode. Let's first of all look at some of the compositions that we might use for the, for the cathode, lanthium strontium cobalt ferrate, a perovskite oxide, ceria gadolinia fluorite electrolyte, and an anode might be a cermate consisting of ceria gadolinia and nickel. Uh, the cathode and the anode are porous. The electrolyte is dense, obviously, to stop uh, permeation of fuel into uh, the, the oxygen compartment, or to the way around. Um, but we already are beginning to build up quite a complex structure. And there are many interfaces in this structure. There's the gas solid interface at the cathode where oxygen exchange takes place. Internally in these ceramics, there are grain boundaries which can block or can transmit oxygen. There are also twin boundaries in some of these materials. Also in the electrolyte, we have the same possibility of grain boundaries. There are solid, solid interfaces between the individual ceramic layers. And if we have composites, there are solid, solid interfaces within uh, the composites. So it's a complex system. We have multi-component oxides with heterogeneous and homogeneous interfaces. In fact, it's a very high degree of complexity to be able to optimize this, this, this whole system. Uh, and here's a typical example, just a, a, a micrograph through a, a, a solid oxide cell with the dense electrolyte layer, uh, an electrode layer above and below, and then some form of, of support, be it on the anode or the cathode side, or even a, a metal support. Again, a very high degree of complexity in this all ceramic device. So what I'm going to talk about today is I want to talk about lattice transport of oxygen in the fluorites and the perovskites, something about the gas solid interface, surfaces and segregation, something about solid, solid interfaces, electrode electrolyte, grain boundaries, and if we get time, move on to twin boundaries. Well, first, I just want to make a comment of how unusual these materials are. They're all oxygen ion conductors, and what I've got here is a plot of the diffusivity, the self-diffusivity, versus reciprocal temperature with the temperature at the top. Now, because they're all oxygen ion conductors, these oxygen ion diffusivities are very high, and we're talking about uh, uh, diffusivities in the region of 10 to the minus 6. If we look at the cation diffusivities in these materials, these tend to be very low. In fact, we have approximately 10 orders of magnitude difference in these uh, diffusivities. Um, uh, and that, that is in itself an interest. It means that the, 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 the reaction time or the characteristic times for the two sublattices are very different. The oxygen uh, atoms react very quickly to any cation distribution. The cation redistribution is very slow and it occurs over very long time scales. This is fast, this is very slow. But actually, this is the inverse to the case that we would expect in a normal ceramic. If we look at a normal ceramic like alumina, then the oxygen ion, which is the largest ion in the lattice by, by a long way, is, um, is the slower mover and the cation is the, is the fast moving uh, uh, material. So in essence, we're trying to optimize uh, ceramics uh, and they are very different sort of ceramics where the largest ion in the lattice is the, the one that we're trying to get to move the fastest. Now, I'll just take a little bit of a historical uh, um, uh, uh, aspect to, to, to this work. When, when, when I started, and meant, that's many years ago, um, there were lots of plots like this around showing log of conductivity versus reciprocal temperature. They're all Arrhenius plots that I'm going to show you, all of them. And we have here the conductivity of various different electrolytes 
Invariably, there was a box that said, we need to get in here to get to low temperature applications. But there was no real idea why these materials showed different levels of, of conductivity, why the Sirias were better than the Zirconias, et cetera, et cetera. Another plot here showing the sort of ranges of conductivity that we could get from <clears throat> what were considered almost to be equivalent materials. So one of the first things that, that, that I did in my career was to try uh, uh, and sort some of, some of this out by looking uh, at the, uh, in particular, the fluorite oxides. So let's just have a look at the fluorite oxides. And I'm going to take ionic conductivity in the fluorite oxides and fluorite electrolytes. They're all based on the stoichiometry NO2. This is the crystal structure. The metal atoms here are on this face-centered cubic lattice and the oxygen ions are on the simple cubic lattice here, marked in red. The materials are zirconia, ceria, and thoria, all with tetravalent cations, and they made oxygen deficient by substitution with these lower valent cations. And ion transport, oxygen ion transport, is by a vacancy mechanism. So for the cereas, we can produce things like ceria yttria, ceria gadolinia, and ceria scandia. And even when we put the same amount of these substitutions in, we get very different conductivities. Ceria gadolinia is a very good uh, conductor. Ceria scandia is a rather poor. And there was no real idea as to why this was, was the case. So we need really to look at the equation for the conductivity of these materials. This is it. I'm not going to go through all the terms, but really to point out that the two most important terms in here uh, that vary very strongly from an oxide to oxide are the oxygen vacancy concentration, uh, which is denoted here, and the migration enthalpy. And that is the amount of energy that you need to put into the system to get an oxygen ion to move from one side to the other. Here's an equivalent expression for the, the self-diffusion coefficient. And what really matters is, is the oxygen concentration of the free vacancies, those that are able to move. Uh, because some of these vacancies are put in and are actually structural vacancies and they're not, not free to move and this migration enthalpy. So let's look at the defect chemistry in Syria gadolinia. As we add gadolinia as a substitutional uh, into Syria, we produce these substitutional cations which are effectively negatively charged. Oxygen, of course, on the oxygen sublattice and a vacancy. For each two gadolinias, we get one vacancy. And here's the electroneutrality condition. But it was realized early on that these two are oppositely charged. The substitute and the oxygen vacancy have op opposite charges, opposite effective charges. This, oh, sorry, uh, this is, oh no. Now this uh, has happened before, I'm sorry to say. And I'm going to have to go back and restart. Here we go. Sorry about that. Um, so we were talking about this. This is a neutrality condition. And it's realized that these are oppositely charged and they could form into uh, uh, associates. Uh, and this is a little picture of an associate, the fluorite lattice again, the cerium host atoms, the oxygen atoms. And this is the gadolinia substitutional. And this is the vacancy. And when the vacancy sits in a near neighbor site, we call it an associate. And we have to add in an extra bit of energy to free this vacancy from this uh, um, uh, dopant cation for out of this associate so that it can move through the lattice and contribute towards the conductivity. OK, so how do we go about optimizing the conductivity in these materials? Let's first look at how the conductivity changes with the concentration of the uh, additive of the substitute. And here, some old data on Syria yttria solid solutions. And the first thing to notice is that as we go through the conductivity and we add more and more of the, um, uh, uh, of the yttria, or any of, in fact, of these uh, substituents, we go through a conductivity maximum. Uh, and that is accompanied by a minimum in the activation energy for, for conductivity. And we can split this into two regions. First is the low concentration region, where we believe that these simple pair associates are forming. And it was proposed quite some time ago that the effect of populating the lattice with these associates, we have electrostatic interaction between them, and it weakened the binding energy of these pairs and hence the activation went down. Uh, 
But when we get to a point here, which is about a few percent of the, uh, the additive, we move into a high concentration regime where these are so populous now that we get the formation of higher defect clusters with much tighter binding. The activation energy shoots up and the conductivity drops down. So <laughs> clearly in terms of uh, the amount of additive, there is an optimum amount that we need to put in to get the lowest activation energy and the highest conductivity. It was also proposed by Faber really quite some time ago in 1989, that we ought to look at the relaxations that surround these substitution atoms, because this may have some effect on this um, uh, activation energy minimum. And we'll get to that in, in, in a moment. Um, not that long ago, we took this data from Faber and Faber, what he'd done was uh, to look at a set of series with different substitutionals, neodymium, ytterbium, yttrium, gadolinium, and lanthanum. Look at the concentration dependence, and in each case, he found the maximum in the conductivity and the minimum in this um, activation energy. I'll just go back to the, the laser pointer. The minimum in the activation energy. Uh, and there was a set of these, these minima all occurring at slightly different points. So what we did was to take this data and then plot it three-dimensionally by uh, adding the ionic radiance of the substituent that we put into the stereo lattice. And when you do that, you see that another minimum emerges. It's the minima in these concentration minima. And if we plot that out now as the minimum in the activation energy from here versus the ionic radius, we can see we come to a minimum point at around gadolinium addition into the serial lattice. And this correlated very well with some uh, um, um, yeah, calculations, some lattice simulations that Robin Grimes has done before, where they um, looked at the binding energy of these, of these pairs, um, that is the dopant vacancy pair, or the substitute vacancy pair in Syria. Here's the radius of the cerium ion, and they found that they found a minimum, just about at gadolinia, where um, the, uh, uh, where the, uh, uh, the ion is slightly larger than the, uh, the radius of, of the CE4+. Plus. So that was a, a, a beginning to understand why this minimum occurs in the, uh, with, with uh, regard to the ionic radius or the ionic size. Um, but I was still interested in, in what happened with the relaxations around these substitutional ions. And at Eisner, I met up with Sean Bishop, who was working on um, uh, uh, chemical expansion. Uh, and he was working with uh, Dario Marichelli doing some uh, MD and lattice, uh, lattice uh, um, dynamics, molecular dynamics. Uh, and I asked them if they would look at the relaxations around the substituents in the serial lattice. And what they found was that for small atoms, there is a strong relaxation. So that tends to to, to, to bind this oxygen vacancy quite tightly. For intermediate sizes, the relaxations are quite small. And for large atoms, then you begin to uh, invoke again these large relaxations. And for the oxygen vacancy, the oxygen relax inwards. For the substitutional, the oxygen relax outwards. So it's a matter of balancing these relaxations so that we get a minimum disturbance of the, uh, uh, of the host lattice. Um, they also measured the uh, effective size of the oxygen ion vacancy. This was for their chemical expansion uh, uh, studies. And they noticed that in zirconia, it was smaller than the oxide ion radius, and that it was actually a maximum for Syria. So for Syria, with one of these intermediate sized um, uh, substituents, you disturb the lattice the least, and that leads to the best uh, conductivity. So the, 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 uh, the, um, the take home message really is find a host lattice and a substituent where the substitution produces the least uh, uh, distortion of the host lattice and then we will uh, arrive at maximum conductivity because we avoid all, all this uh, defect association and defect clustering. Now I want to move on to the perovskite materials. Uh, and these essentially, after uh, we've just been looking at the electrolytes, essentially now we're beginning to look at the electrodes. 
I think we're all familiar with the perovskite structure. The A cations are 12 coordinated. The B cations sit at the center of this octagen octahedra. There are many types, but we're going to focus on what are known as the three, three perovskites, where the A cation valence is three and the uh, B cation valence is three, as for instance in uh, uh, lanthanum ferrate. And again, let's look at a bit of the defect uh, chemistry. Uh, most of these materials are mixed ionic electronic conductors, Mi, uh, MiX, uh, and we're going to look at quite a lot of data on these MiX. And mostly we have lanthanum on the A site with substitution by strontium. So let's have a look at, at, at the defect chemistry. Substitution on the lanthanum site with strontium leads to the formation of vacancies, uh, just as we saw with the electrolyte materials. And if that's the only reaction to occur, we can produce an oxide electrolyte, such as a lanthanum strontium gallate. But in materials where we have um, transition metals on, on the B sites, we get the possibility of oxidation. And we have this reaction where there's the oxidation of the, uh, of the oxygen vacancies to produce electronic holes. And we now have a material where we have electronic conductors and uh, ionic conductors, and we have one of these mixed ionic electronic conductors. Also for completeness, it's also possible to react vacancies with uh, uh, with water to produce protonic mixed ionic electronic conductors, or even full hydrogenation to produce protonic electrolytes. And the neutrality condition for, for most of these 3,3 uh, three perovskites is that the substitutional is balanced by holes, protons, and oxygen vacancies. And in all these materials, these three uh, mobile species will occur. Their, their prevalence has been worked out in, in a paper by Roger Merkler and uh, Joachim Meyer. Um, but we will get them to a greater or a lesser extent. And we're essentially going to be looking at materials where the dominant uh, carriers are the oxygen vacancy and the electronic hole. Now, just as an aside here, as we move into these electronically conducting materials, we have to use another technique to, uh, to measure the oxygen transport. Uh, and that is uh, isotopic exchange SIMS. And briefly, we do an isotope switch at high temperature, introduce a stable isotope into the, into the material, and we measure it using SIMS. So we spot her away uh, and we measure the spotted flux and we measure the isotopic content. And we can get, as a function of depth, the isotopic penetration profile, which leads us to the diffusion coefficient. We'll look at that in, in a moment. But while I'm on iron beam techniques, I'll just mention um, uh, the low energy ion scattering technique, which we'll look at later. And in this case, we bounce atoms off the surface. In this case, it's helium. And we measure the energy of the um, scattered particle. And that tells us the mass of the particle that it's, that it's hit, it's collided with on the surface. And it provides us essentially with a, a mass signature of what atoms are on the very surface layer uh, of these materials. And we'll come back to this when we look at surfaces in, in a moment. So John, this excuse is, uh, me, excuse me. I'll, I'll... So I can hear a little bit the typing, the, the noise of typing. So I'd like to ask all the audience to mute your microphone. Thank you. Thank you, John. Sorry. OK. OK, thank you, Hirishige. Um, uh, this is the, the solution to the diffusion equation we're using. This is the type of data that we can get from the SIMS. We can get very nice data from the SIMS. We fit that to, to, to this equation. And we get the diffusion coefficient. In this case, it's the tracer diffusion coefficient, but it's very uh, closely related to the self-diffusion coefficient and the surface exchange coefficient. And this is some old data on lanthanum strontium cobalt ferrate, log of D and K, R, K, advanced reciprocal temperature. And the diffusion coefficient, essentially, we're going to look at it in a moment, is explained by the defect chemistry to look at the surface exchange coefficient. We also need to look at the defect chemistry, but we need to think about the surface chemistry uh, uh, as well. So now let's look at some literature values, not of conductivity this time, but of oxygen diffusivity in these perovskite mixed ionic electronic conductors. So here we have the diffusivity, here we have reciprocal temperature and the real temperature at the top. And the first thing to notice is the span. 
of these diffusivities from some of the very poorest diffusers to some of the very best diffusers. And we're almost going up to, to nine and a bit orders of magnitude, almost 10 orders of magnitude. So a very wide range, much wider than we saw for the, for, for the electrolytes, a huge range. And we can break this down really into three groups. There's the low uh, diffusing materials, such as the lanthanum and manganates. There are some intermediate materials, and these tend to be um, some of the strontium-free or the low strontium additives into these perovskites. And then there's the very high diffusers, such as this one. This is strontium doped samarium cobaltate at 50 50. Uh, and here the diffusivity is approaching 10 to the minus 6. Now that is really remarkable for the oxygen ion. We're talking about diffusivities that get very close to um, uh, that of a, a, a liquid. And in the early days of looking at these materials, we, we often talked about uh, sublattice melting uh, when we saw these very high values of, uh, of diffusivity. Now, what about the associates that we looked at for the electrolyte? Well, we have the possibility in these materials of forming an associate with the oxygen vacancy, uh, just as we saw in the electrolyte materials. But this has been shown by some calculations in, from Richard Catalow's group to be very weak indeed. So it's certainly not the origin of this large span of, of, uh, of differences. So the question is, does the oxidation reduction reaction of these transition metal B cations, such as cobalt and iron, control this free vacancy population by this uh, oxidation reaction? Well, we can look at that, and it means essentially the optimization of the non stoichiometry We have the diffusion data from, from our SIMS experiments, and we can relate that to this, this equation. It's uh, an approximate but simple equation that our self-diffusion or tracer diffusion is related to the oxygen vacancy concentration times the um, vacancy diffusion coefficient. And this is essentially the mobility of the, uh, of the vacancies in this uh, perovskite lattice. We can get the non-stoichiometry, the oxygen vacancy, from non-stoichiometry studies of these materials. And then we can plot the values of this vacancy diffusion coefficient. And uh, this is something we did um, quite a while ago in a book uh, that was published with uh, Tatsumi Ishihara as the, uh, uh, as the editor. And when you do that, that huge range of uh, nine orders of nine and a half orders of magnitude collapses down into almost one order of magnitude. And what that is saying is that this is the oxygen vacancy concentration, the control of the non stoichiometry is the most important factor for these perovskite materials. Yes, the migration enthalpy in the host lattices do matter, but it is really uh, outweighed by this huge variation in oxygen vacancy concentration in these uh, materials. So that has covered really the, the, the um, uh, transport of oxygen within the bulk. Let's now look at the transport of oxygen across some of the interfaces that occur in these materials. And let's look, at the, first of all, at the gas solid interface. Um, early on in the work on fuel cells, we were using platinum as an electrode and the oxygen gas um, uh, incorporation reaction was occurring at triple phase boundaries where we had uh, access to the electrons, the vacancies in the electrolyte and uh, the dissociated oxygen on the surface uh, of, of the platinum. Very early on it was realized that if we moved to these mixed ionic electronic conductors then this reaction, the adsorption, uh, um, dissociation, and incorporation into, the, into this uh, 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 mixed ionic electronic conductor could occur at any point over this surface. And so these are much, much more active cathode materials. Um, but to understand the processes that are going on here, we need to understand what's going on with the surface exchange reaction. It's often the limiting step. And it, obviously, we need to understand something about the um, defect chemistry of these mixed ionic electronic conductors. But we also need to understand what's going on here at the surface, the surface chemistry. So let's see if we can investigate some of, of these problems. 
First of all, let's go back to, to, to literature data. And this is the value of the surface exchange coefficient versus reciprocal temperature with temperature up here. And if we look at the span now from some of the fast diffusing materials down to the slow diffusing materials, then the um, uh, uh, surface exchange coefficient uh, mirrors that, but it shows much less spread than the D values. We're now talking about four and a bit orders of magnitude instead of nine. So K shows less spread than D. It shows the same tr uh, uh, trends. The, the faster diffusers have faster surfaces. The slower diffusers have slower surfaces. So K and D are related. And this is something that Roger de Souza and I uh, realized many, many years ago. We plotted log of the surface exchange against log of D, and we got a weak uh, but, but noticeable trend in the, the high D materials had high K values, low D materials tended to have the low uh, uh, K values. Uh, and really, this is saying, because we've already said that this is dominated by the oxygen vacancy concentration, that the oxygen vacancy concentration is obviously important in determining the value of K. But what about the surface chemistry? Um, we're looking at these three, three perovskites again, and now we're going to look at some lice data where I said um, earlier on that we uh, scatter ions from the surface and we can see what's on this very outermost surface. Now, early on, if you look in the literature about what one might expect for the termination of these 3-3 three, three perovskites, one might expect a low index surface either to terminate in a sheet of AO atoms or a sheet of BO2 atoms. And in the 4-4 four, four perovskites, this uh, will occur because these are charge neutral. But this is not the case in the 3-3, three, three, so we didn't really understand what was going to happen for the termination of some of these 3-3 three, three perovskites. Now again, all the comments I'm going to make are relevant to fuel cell um, uh, or SOEC operating conditions. So we're talking about operating at high temperatures. This is a rather high temperature, um, but in high oxygen pressures. And LSCF was one of the first materials that we looked at. Um, and what we saw was the following. This is the very surface spectrum of a sample that's been annealed at these high temperatures in high oxygen pressures. It's a neon spectrum, so we don't... Uh, I'm sorry, it's happened again, and I'm going to just have to... Uh, stop this and restart. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, and we see strontium at the very outer surface. Um, as we sputter away the, the surface, immediately beneath the surface, we begin to see these B cations. And the B cations, we believe, are important for the oxygen exchange process in providing uh, um, the electron transfer to the, to the oxygen molecule. And we also see the emergence of, of the lanthanum. And then we move, we move down, we move into the bulk composition. So the outer layer of this material is covered by strontium, strontium and oxygen, and uh, the B cations are, are really tucked underneath. As, as it shows in this part of this diagram, the surface is covered by A cations. In this case, all, it's, it's been the strontium that's segregated. Um, but the B cations are just tucked underneath the, that immediate surface. How quickly does this happen? Well, this is some uh, uh, experiments that John Drews did while he was at Eisner. We took a lanthanum strontium cobalt ferric pellet, um, polished off the top, did a, a, a lice spectrum, and we see lanthanum strontium cobalt and iron. Um, when we begin to anneal this at 600 degrees centigrade, after an hour, what we see is the lanthanum is beginning to disappear and the cobalt and iron are beginning to disappear. The strontium is beginning to emerge after a few hours. And after eight hours, the strontium is getting really quite strong. And we can follow, um, uh, sorry, those ratios uh, here on, uh, on this uh, right-hand side panel. So it's clear from these experiments that this happens very quickly. The surface strontium comes out after just one hour. 
there's a bit of a plateau after four hours. I think this may be a, a little bit of a, um, uh, an experimental artifact, actually. I think that the, uh, it's just that the time scale gets much longer, but the strontium continues to come out. The beta A ratio is steadily decreasing. We're getting A rich on these surfaces. And there are significant changes, as I said, just after one hour. And bear this in mind that the device lifetime in these uh, um, uh, devices is tens of thousands of hours. So the strontium is really going to uh, uh, completely cover the surfaces. Um, one thing we are also looking at at, at this point, because we're looking at ceramics, um, in a ceramic, of course, we have different orientations of the different grains at the surface. Would we get any orientation effects in the, um, uh, in the surface exchange coefficient? And this is some work that we did uh, with Bilge Yildiz at MIT, looking at epitaxial layers of a perovskite related lanthanum strontium cobalt. And we found no orientation effect because the surface was dominated by this uh, segregated strontium rich layer at the top. And what we saw, in fact, when we we're looking at high, high resolution TEM, that there were some uh, low angle grain boundaries in this film. Sitting on top of this low angle grain boundary is a particle of strontium oxide. And it's the strontium is, is transporting rapidly up these grain boundaries and onto the surface. In some later work on a, a epitaxial LSCF uh, with uh, at Lane Martin, uh, and this shows some of the, the, the DFT simulations. We did see experimentally that the 111 surface seemed to be certainly more active than the others. And I think this is all due in part to the structure of this 111 surface uh, and due in part to the fact that the strontium segregation in this experiment was not as strong as in, in this experiment. So controlling strontium segregation is, 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 is an obvious means to uh, get activity onto these surfaces. And you can do it in a number of ways. This is some work that was done with Jürgen Fleiss group uh, and the group at, at Eisner with John Drews and um, uh, uh, Helena Teliev. They uh, produced some LSC 64 dense films on, on, on YSZ. And notice that as they aged them, the semicircle for these, uh, uh, and they were uh, uh, symmetric cells, they began to uh, increase in resistance, the electro resistance began to increase with time. We did lights on these and noticed that as the uh, annealed at 600, then the strontium as gain was coming out. But if you wash that surface with water, you could essentially wash this, uh, the strontium off. You retained then the lanthanum, strontium and cobalt and the films uh, regained their, uh, uh, their high activity and this, uh, this, this lower um, electrode resistance. And this was repeatable. You could anneal, wash off, anneal, wash off, anneal, wash off. So even though you're removing the strontium, you can't get rid of it, it will come out again. And again, I think it's uh, these green boundaries that are, that are important for the transport of oxygen to the surface. And quite recently, in fact, published in uh, March in J Power Sources, uh, Judith uh, Briscoll's group showed that if they um, uh, um, etch LSCF surfaces with um, acetic acid, again, they remove the strontium and they get a high activity. Well, why do we see uh, in all those materials that we looked at earlier, why do we see some correlation between what is the uh, bulk diffusivity and the surface exchange coefficient if those surfaces are covered in strontium oxide? Well, to sort of sort that out, we went to uh, Alex Steikoff at Eisner um, to do some simulations. And he said, well, LSCF is a bit difficult to start with. So we'll start with strontium titanate and look at the SRO surface on strontium titanate. And on a defect free SRO terminated surface, the oxygen is not readily activated. So SRO really uh, deactivates the surface. But if we put in an oxygen vacancy, then there is access through that oxygen vacancy to this layer of B cations in the layer below. And we have interaction between these, these Z squared orbitals of the, in this case, the titanium and the pi star of the uh, O2, and it activates into the uh, superoxo state. 
um, and that was published some time ago. We also looked at the electron density in oxygen vacancies and showed that these were uh, quite uh, 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 areas of high electron density. So attractive for dissociating the oxygen. And also as a bit of an aside, uh, following on from these, we were looking at strontium free materials and in, in particular lanthanum nickel oxide. Um, uh, which also shows a high surface exchange coefficient. And that was rather interesting because this doesn't have oxygen vacancies in it. And what we found here was that the lanthanum is active in dissociating uh, the, the oxygen. The electronic configuration of lanthanum is xenon and then this 5D16S2. And it's normally thought of as a trivalent ion. In other words, all these electrons are, 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 are um, removed. What we found is that if we look with DFT and experimentally, it's closer to LA2+, and the electron in this 5D orbital is actually shared in a sort of semi-covalent way between the oxygen and, and the lanthanum. So having A cations of lanthanum on the surface is, is, is in, in fact, not a bad thing. Having strontium oxide on the surface is a bad thing and the only way that we can get uh, activity is if an oxygen vacancy can get up, up to that surface. So that's the gas solid interface and now I'll move on to the solid solid interfaces. And the first one I want to look at are the heterogeneous ones. This is uh, found in composite electro electrodes. Uh, we have electronic conductor and an ionic conductor mainly in composites. Uh, they're mainly perovskite fluorite combinations. We've investigated a series of these, YSZ, LSM, CGO, LSCF, Zirconia scandia, lanthanum chromate. And with the SIMs, we can look at the individual, what's happening in the individual parts of these, these composites. We can also get the overall parameters by analyzing the whole area. And to cut a long story short, what we see is we get effective parameters for this composite, which seem to show some synergistic effects. If we look in detail at the individual phases, we see that K for the perovskite phase is in general lowered, and K for the fluorite phase is in general uh, increased. The LICE results show that for these isolated phases after high temperature, high PO2 exposure, the fluorite surfaces are covered in impurities, which blocks the surface, but the perovskite surfaces are very clean. And this is a statement actually, which is very important. It's the reason I think that solid oxide fuel cells work at all, is that these perovskite surfaces do not seem to suffer from contamination, which could block this uh, oxygen um, uh, um, uh, re uh, exchange reaction. They do have strontium segregation, but they don't have uh, coverage of by impurities such as silicon. And here are the publications dealing with all, all this work. So what are the possible mechanisms for the, for the K changes? Well, we could have catalytic spillover as is often uh, uh, put about in the, in the catalytic literature, where we get rapid dissociation of the oxygen on the electronically conducting phase. It can surface diffuse and then get incorporated into the, into the ionically conducting phase. Or we could have some interdiffusion of the transition metal cations that activate the CGO surface in this case. Or we could have the following, which is called a surface cleaning effect, whereby the impurities that are originally on the, on the surface of the CGO are absorbed into the, into the perovskite and both surfaces now become active for our, our oxygen exchange. And so to try and prove this, we did an experiment whereby we took a, an ionic conductor, scandia stabilized zirconia and a lanthanum chromate, fused them together into, to, into a pellet, took sections, transferred sections out to that, then oxygen exchanged these and looked at them with SIMS and lice. So here's our interface between uh, an ionic conductor and a, and a mixed ionic electronic conductor. We've oxygen exchanged this and with the SIMS, we're going to look at the O18 distribution away from this interface. And as we do that, first of all, we see that in by looking into the lanthanum chromate, the, the ionic conductor, we have a good diffusion profile. 
but compared to what we would get if this material was on its own, the surface concentration is depressed. In other words, the, the surface exchange coefficient is lowered. And in fact, there is quite a turn down of, of oxygen 18 at the surface. But as we move into the ionic conductor, we see that <clears throat> we have, oh, darn. I'm really sorry about this, uh, this again. Uh, has been a real problem with this, my dual screens here. Um, and I shall hope to be, get this going again. Yeah, so we're on the, uh, um, uh, the reduction of K into, in, in, the, in this phase. And then what we see in the ionically conducting phase is that yes, we have uh, more O18 close to this interface than we would expect in the isolated phase. And this drops off as we move away from this interface. And look, we're moving quite a distance away. We're moving uh, 700 and odd microns away to a thousand microns away from that interface. And we see the uh, O18 uh, uh, dropping off, but it's slightly higher in this case, uh, uh, relatively much higher than one would expect in the isolated phase. So what did we see when we looked at the lice? Well, when we looked at the lice on this, this surface, we saw zirconia, scandia, and oxygen, as one would expect for scandia stabilized zirconia. At the outer surface, we, we went down, so that's into the, into the screen here, and we saw essentially the, the, the same. So what we're saying was uh, on this surface, we essentially see the stoichiometric scandia stabilized zirconia. If we take the material in isolation away from one of these interfaces and anneal it, what we see on the immediate surface is something like this. It's covered in potassium, calcium, silica impurities. Okay, we have to go down, sputter this off the surface first and go down to about five nanometers before we see the pattern that we see on the bare surface close to this Scandia, uh, to this interface with the mixed ionic conductor. And we believe that this is caused by this cleaning effect uh, of the impurities from here being absorbed into this uh, perovskite material. Um, I'm gonna skip over this, but uh, we need more techniques to, to be able to look at um, uh, interfaces. And this is a technique that we use to look at um, an ionic conductor interface, YSZ and Syria, using this melt and recrystallize method to able to simulate this interface. And, uh, and it was quite successful. I'm not going to go into that in detail because we're getting short on time. I want to move on to grain boundaries now. Here's the real structure. Here's what we normally think of in terms of a model of a, a, a material with grain boundaries, a bricklayer model. We have the diffusion uh, uh, along the grain boundaries, and this can be enhancing. And this is a flux along the grain boundary. And recently, there's been a publication from Bilger Yildiz's group, which showed that in the core of the grain boundaries of this LSM material, the oxygen vacancy concentration in the bulk is quite low, but it's enhanced in the core of the grain boundary, and it enhances the grain boundary a lot, uh, the, the uh, oxygen diffusion along the grain boundary. But it's now been known for quite some time that the flux across the grain boundary can be inhibited, and it can be inhibited by the presence of impurities or by the presence of uh, space charge layers. And this is a publication from Roger de Souza uh, on zirconia showing space charge layers. What I didn't have time to say earlier was there was another optimization process that was used in the fluorite, fluorite electrolytes after we got the grains themselves uh, being very fast uh, uh, oxygen conductors. We had to uh, uh, optimize the processing to remove impurities from all these grain boundaries to uh, minimize the blocking effects at the grain boundaries. Still left with space charge effects, but we were able to remove the uh, impurity effects. This is much less of a problem with the perovskite materials because, as I said before, they're not able to um, easily accommodate uh, a lot of uh, uh, cations, and so impurity segregation is, uh, is much reduced. 
Now, uh, I'm just going to explain a little bit about the measurement of brain boundary diffusion by oxygen diffusion processes. Um, uh, it's really been uh, uh, described well into these two Harrison diffusion regimes. So the material is modeled as the surface, which we exchange oxygen 18. This is the diffusion front. The grain boundaries are of thickness delta, the grains are of thickness d, and the diffusion distance in the um, grain is, but is denoted by root dt. And where root dt is much greater than the grain size, we get this type A behavior, and essentially we have what looks like a, 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 a single phase, a homogeneous uh, medium, uh, and we can get one diffusion coefficient. It happens to be an effective diffusion coefficient in, in this case. But where um, the uh, size of the grain boundary is less than root dt, is much less than the grain size, we get into type B behavior and we get this type of, of profile. And from this early part, we can extract the bulk, it's called bulk here, but it really means the lattice diffusion coefficient. And for the grain boundary, we can extract this parameter. It's the grain boundary diffusivity, the diffusivity here, times the width of the grain boundary delta. Now, let's just return to this plot of lattice diffusion of these perovskite oxides versus reciprocal temperature. Uh, and again, we've got this rather, rather large span. In these materials with lower uh, diffusion coefficients, we tend to see the emergence of grain boundaries in the, these uh, diffusion experiments uh, because we're in this Harrison type B regime. In the middle, we're in the intermediate range, but the top here, we tend to be in Harrison A type regime. So, uh, la and lattice transport dominates. So an example is this, this, this diffusion profile I showed for LSCF some time ago. Um, that was taken at 800 degrees centigrade, and it's a, a really fits very nicely to the uh, homogeneous uh, me medium. In contrast, if we were to look at the lanthanum strontium manganate, this is work from Roger de Souza when he was a PhD student with me. And from this early part here, we can uh, get the lattice diffusivity. But if we look at the tail part here, we can get the, the diffusivity of the grain boundary. And you can see that the uh, grain boundary diffusivity is enhanced by one, two, three, about four orders of magnitude uh, above the, um, uh, uh, the, the lattice diffusivity. The grain boundaries are diffusing faster. And we work out this grain boundary diffusivity by assuming that the grain boundary width is one nanometer. And that's an assumption in all the things that I'm, I'm going to show from now on. Quite recently, people have been making nanostructured thin films where we have a lot of these grain boundaries in these uh, LSMs, in particular this 20% this substituted material. Uh, indeed, it, it increases the, uh, the activity in terms of the diffusion and surface exchange of the whole of the film. You can extract the diffusivity in the grain boundaries by using finite element methods. And here is the grain boundary diffusivity extracted for these thin films. It's close to that that's from the ceramic, but it looks as though it has a lesser activation energy. And this may be a reflection for the fact that in these thin films with columnar grains, we have rather special grain boundaries, um, whereas in, in the ceramic, we have rather more general distribution of grain boundaries. So the final point to make from this slide is that grain boundaries are only fast relative to the bulk. Okay, so even though we've got a fast grain boundary compared to some of the very fast materials, such as the Samaria doped, uh, strontium doped Samaria cobaltate, they're still only uh, moderate uh, diffusers. Um, and as operating temperatures decrease, we move down into this, into this regime where grain boundaries uh, uh, will become Im important. Okay, let's have a look at the grain boundary diffusion products that are in, in, in the literature. This is DGB delta now, um, and here this is reciprocal temperature, real temperature in the top. Uh, this is in a publication that's just come out a few days ago in uh, J Electric MSOC. 
Uh, and we see again um, uh, some different regions. Here are the LSMs and the lantern uh, chromates. And the literature data tends to focus on these uh, on these materials uh, because they have a low diffusivity. Uh, uh, for the high diffusers, you don't see these grain boundary tails, and so they're mainly uh, 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 literature data um, confined to LSM and LSCRF. Here are the thin films that have been made of LSMs. Uh, again, the activation energy looks slightly different from those in in the ceramic samples. Here's one of those strontium-free perovskites. It's a little bit higher, but very interesting is this result from uh, PZT. This is from Jürgen Fleiss Group in, in Vienna. Um, and really this is quite high grain boundary diffusivity. And at the moment, it's not clear uh, why, why this occurs. We've been looking at uh, observations in uh, lanthanum strontium cobalt ferrate recently uh, with Vincent Toroton at, when he was at Eisner. And here are two examples of depth profiles at 350 and 600 degrees C. And at 350, we're in the Harrison B regime, 600 in the Harrison A. So from these, we can extract some grain boundary diffusion. And here is the Arrhenius plot. Again, we've assumed a, um, a grain boundary width of one nanometer to get these diffusion coefficients. So here is the lattice diffusion. Here is the grain boundary diffusion. Again, we've got an enhancement of about four orders of magnitude over what is the lattice diffusion. Note that the activation energy here looks very similar, which implies, but doesn't prove, that the same mechanism of transport is involved. Here we have what is known as the Leclerc beta factor, which just tells us something about the uh, reliability of this green boundary data, which gets really uh, very much um, poorer as we go to the higher temperatures. And above around fine 50, we don't see any more of these tails. They're, they're, they're not visible in these experiments. If we now plot that grain boundary diffusivity on the plot we've just looked at before, LSCF6428 comes out to be have the highest grain boundary uh, uh, delta um, product that has been noted in literature so far, uh, as far as I, I, I'm aware. And this is really quite remarkable because if we look at 500 degrees centigrade, the uh, diffusivity that uh, uh, we would get if we assume that delta is one nanometer, the, the DGB uh, delta product is 10 to the minus 14. So this would give us a value of about 10 to the minus seven centimeters squared at uh, 500 degrees centigrade. And if we were to go back to the plot of those um, bulk uh, diffusers, those lattice diffusion, this is way above anything that is seen in any of those materials. So this is, is really very fast diffusion indeed at, at, at 500 degrees centigrade. Now, it may not be all that simple because at low temperature, the microstructure of these materials is heavily twinned. And it could well be that the twin boundaries in this material are participating in the transport of oxygen. And it may be a combination of fast diffusion, down grain boundaries and twin boundaries that is giving us this very high uh, 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 DGB delta uh, product. Uh, and this is something that we, we would like to prove uh, and we haven't been able to do, but this very high value of DGB delta for LSCF does imply that if we were to go to the nanostructured films like the LSM, we would get even better behavior from LSCF at low temperature. And that remains to be shown to be the case. Finally, uh, if we're to investigate these grain boundaries uh, even further, we need to move to much more high resolution techniques, such as focused ion beam sims. This is some work we did on, on bismuth oxide, looking at the diffusion, not at the grain boundary, but the grain boundary is here, and this is away from the grain boundary into the bulk of the material. So looking at how the oxygen distributes within the grains and away from the grain boundaries, but I think the really powerful technique is to use atom probe. And this is a paper that came out of Albert Tarek Kohn's group in Barcelona. They were looking at some serious Samaria LSM 
vertically aligned nanostructures that had been oxygen exchanged. They were able to see the O16 and O18 distributions, as well as the cation distributions, but on a nanometric scale, to be able to see what is going on in these grain boundaries at that nanometer scale, coupled with TEM, I think this is, is the way forward to understanding exactly what is occurring uh, at the grain boundary. So the conclusions. Lattice transport of oxygen, uh, it can be understood in terms of these mobile vacancy concentrations, trapping and non-stoichiometry is important. Oxygen transport across the gas solid interface is related to surface chemistry, termination, segregation are important, um, uh, as is the uh, um, non-stoichiometry. Understanding the cation transport in ceramics is also an important factor because the segregation uh, kinetics are, are, are limited by the transport of these cations to the surface and indeed to grain boundaries. Heterogeneous shows synergistic effects, and this, I believe, is, is caused by the surface scattering of impurities by the perovskite phase. In all cases, the grain boundary diffusion is faster than the bulk, assuming that the boundary width delta is small uh, and constant. And we don't know that that is actually the case, but we assume it is the case at the moment. Nanostructured thin films have been shown to greatly improve the oxygen transport properties of what I call poor mixed conductors for example, the LSM20, and it's still not clear if this can be translated to the more high performance materials. And there's a need for these very high resolution techniques to determine local chemistry and transport properties on an atomic, on a nanometer scale. Finally, with the acknowledgements, I'd like to thank Eisner for, for putting up with me for, for over 10 years. UK EPSRC for, for supporting a lot of this work and buying some of the uh, advanced instrumentation and WPI uh, MEXT in Japan and JSPS for their uh, help, in particular in funding this call to call program, solid oxide interfaces for fast dry and transport and soy fit. And finally, for all the people who've been involved, in particular, John Druce, Elena Tellius, uh, Vincent Sordaton, Monica Buriel, Matt Niani, and, and Sam Cooper, and the whole of the Electro Ceramics Group at Imperial, and in particular at Kyushu, uh, Tatsumi Ishihara, and, and Alex Steikov. And I'd like to thank you all for putting up with me and the problems that I've had with my dual screens. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you for a very extensive and very instructive instructive presentation uh, lecture about the oxide ion transport in solids and also the electrode materials. And I'd like to announce to you because uh, you didn't uh, you have not yet noticed the number of the participants are 101. Uh, as far as I recognize, I think it is record. And oh. also, yeah, it is a record I, in my understanding. And also maybe my uh, introduction is not suitable because I, I assume uh, all the participants are within from the within Eisner, but uh, I found a lot of people outside Eisner is also attending. So I, uh, I'd like to welcome also the, a lot of people to the John's uh, seminar. So I, now I'd like to open uh, the open the John's seminar for discussion. So if you, I'd like to ask audience, if you have questions or comments, first, please use raise hand function uh, to show, show me. And then I'd like to ask you the question. So please use raise, raise hand function. Okay, Tatsumi, please go ahead. Okay, maybe I will ask you the first <laughs> questions. John, in the first half, you showed that the diffusivity of the oxide ion in the bulk is the, uh, related on the amount of the oxygen vacancies. And the structure seems not so much important, but I think this may be in the so-called lattice diffusion. If the interstitial diffusion, like recent uh, two-dimensional oxide ion conductor, I think this may not uh, 
just determined by the vacancy amount, but to the space yeah. is important. Yeah. No, no, I, I agree with you. And actually, I, I, I was going to talk about interstitial diffusion, but then I decided that I'd <laughs> it's not as well understood as, as, the, um, uh, 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 as the vacancy diffusion effects. So, yeah, I mean, we have looked at some, uh, um, some pr uh, of the, um, how shall I put it, the, 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 the dynamics of, of moving of these oxygen interstitials through, through these layered, layered materials. And it's, it's, it's not simple. It's not simple at all, because as I showed, or as, as uh, Alex showed in the, in the DFT simulations that he did, there is an electronic interaction between the diffusing interstitial and the surrounding lanthanums. So it's, it's, it's not, you know, a, a lot of what I showed right at the beginning about vacancy diffusion is essentially hard spheres, you know, billiard balls and footballs moving around. Okay, so those are the arguments that are made for that. With interstitial diffusion, I think it's far more subtle. So I, I think, you, you know, we have to go to these more sophisticated techniques. And I, you know, as I, I think I showed, um, and perhaps I don't know whether you can, you can still see my screen now. Um, let me see if, no, I've got to go down to, uh, where are we? Um, there, right, if I go down, 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 down. I've got a lot of spares here. <laughs> if I can, there we are, okay. Right in the early stages of looking at oxygen mobility in the perovskites, we were looking at the saddle point, which occurs between these two, um, uh, 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 sorry, the three cations, the two A cations and the B cation. Uh, you know, the first model was, what's the size of this hole through which the oxygen has to pass. And I'd, in this paper published in 1982, so uh, that tells you how old it is. Essentially, all this was done with a ruler and a pair of compasses. You know, it was done by hand. How big is this hole to push the oxygen through? Now you can do DFT calculations. You've got nudged elastic band, you know, the power of what you can do is infinitely more than I could do in 1982. I, I was virtually doing what you might call Victorian science then compared to what we do now. So, I mean, these, are, these early ideas are important, but now we've got the more sophisticated tools. I think those tell us a lot more about, you know, the, what, what I would call the finer detail because uh, it's quite clear that in those uh, oxygen deficient perovskites, vacancy concentration is absolutely dominant. Okay, thank you. And uh, my second question is that you showed that some uh, trapping of the transport oxide ion around the dopant, so yeah. we call clusteri clusterization. But, uh, yeah. but do you think the, what the parameter is the determined to the test uh, um, trapping of the oxide ion or the so-called clusterization of the vacancies. Um, generally, the amount of the dopant is very important, but yes. I think that this not simply the, as explained to the amount of the trapped oxygens. So recently, I feel that uh, a lot of the oxygen vacancies originally trapped around the doped, um, uh, um, around the dopant, and uh, uh, mobile oxide ion is uh, quite small compared to the theoretical amount. Yeah. What do yeah. you think? Yeah, well, uh, as, as I say, in these early calculations, all we were really interested in, uh, and all most people were interested in, was, was the trapping energy. You know, not, not really about what was happening to the lattice. Uh, so you did all these huge calculations. You had all this information about what was happening to the lattice, and most of that was thrown away. And we just took out an energy, what one single parameter. And it wasn't until we started, I started talking to to, to Sean Bishop, 
that, that um, we, we, we began to get interested in what was happening in the relaxations around, uh, around these defects that we put in the lattice. And it's important not only to think about what's happening in this immediate vacancy, you know, how far does this propagate out into the lattice? I think that's important. And I think in different lattices, it will propagate to different amounts. OK, so in some cases, this relaxation can be very local and in other cases, it can be very long range. Yeah. OK, and this this determines when each of those substitutionals see each other, because if this if this sort of uh, um, uh, uh, redistribution is short range, then you can pack them close together. But if it's very long range, they begin to see each other at long distances. So you can only put in very dilute solutions before you start to get complex defect complexing. Now, you know, all this uh, was seen before in the alkali halides, when people were adding um, uh, uh, um, in sodium chloride, they were putting in things like calcium chloride. I, I, think, that, I think that's right. And, and they got the defects, isolated defects, the defect clusters, the clusters, uh, more complex clusters, leading eventually to the precipitation of a second phase. So it's part of a process, okay? Uh, and where you are along that process, I think depends quite strongly on how the lattice reacts to when you put in a foreign iron. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for your very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tatsumi. Thank you. Okay. Alex, you, do you have a question? Yes, uh, John. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful presentation. And it's so good to see you again. And my question is about, uh, you show the lattices of, of uh, perovskite and fluoride together where you were talking about the catalytic synergy effect between both. But I wonder how well is understood the interface between the perovskites and fluorides? How well was investigated the, the, the chemistry of the interface of those two lattices? Yeah, um, a very good question. Uh, and the answer is, is, is uh, I don't think very much at all. Um, I think that, uh, you know, if I, if I try and just find that, that, that bit mm -hmm. here, um, I, I mean, this, this, mm -hmm. this uh, multi-scale modeling that was done on these two electrolyte materials mm -hmm. by, um, uh, uh, by Colby, cool. yeah. I, I know, I know you, you were rather skeptical about it at the time. Right, but, I was. Uh, you know, this melt and recrystallization method, it, 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 it reproduced the sort of structure that we saw at the interface. Mm -hmm. It also reproduced the sort of diffusion behavior in the two mm -hmm. components that we'd expect at the interface. So, I, I, you know, like many of these things, they're not perfect mm -hmm. and they're far from perfect, but, but it's a start to try and use this sort of techniques. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you, you, you might say that this is already an ionic conductor and, and a mixed conductor with, with, with the Syria. Um, but between the fluorite and the perovskites, I, I don't know of, 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 of much, um, many studies that have gone on. And there have been quite a lot of studies of, of, of the interreaction, because what often happens, of course, at these interfaces is that you get the formation of a blocking phase. Uh, uh, and the problem is how to get rid of that blocking phase. Like with, uh, for instance, if you put LSC onto, onto YSZ, it immediately forms the um, uh, lanthanum zirconate, uh, mm -hmm. which is a, 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 a poor, poor conductor mm -hmm. uh, and the blocking phase. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I think it's, it's a rich area to get into. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, next question is uh, Dr. Ono, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm actually from uh, out, you know, from the outside of the Eisner. I'm an assistant professor at Kyushu University, but in the applied, uh, applied chemistry department. Um, thanks for the great talk, and I enjoyed it very much. So, since Ishihara Sensei brought up the sort of a different aspect, uh, in addition to the to the vacancy concentration, there is also the structural effect. I'd like to bring yeah. up, you know. Another thing, um, 
So I'm working on ion conductor as well, but it's a cation conductors, and we do see some influence from the dynamic of the lattices. So the lattice dynamics, if we change the lattice dynamics a little bit, then you know we also see some changes, influences on the uh, cation transport in the, for example, superionic conductors. Um, how is it also a big, that can it have a large influence on the oxygen ion conductors or do you expect it's pretty small in the oxygen ion conductors? Yeah, that's a, another good question. And I'm not sure I know the, the answer to, to, to this one. Um, you know, I did show the, the sort of the, the, the characteristic, it's, not, it's nothing to do with the lattice vibrations, but it's, it's the characteristic transport properties of the, of the two lattices. And there's a huge difference between the mobilities of, 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 of the cations and the mobilities of, of, the, um, of the oxygen ions. Again, that implies, of course, that the cations are in a deep potential well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and really aren't going to move very much, whereas the oxygens are in, uh, have got a much more shallow energy profile. Um, yeah, uh, what, what, well, let me just ask you a question back. What, what sort of uh, ionic conductors were you talking about? Lithium ion or sodium? Yeah, yeah, lithium, lithium and sodium ions. You know, if we, if we have a less interaction between the cation and also the ion framework, you know, we can have sl a smaller um, activation barrier, for example. And, you know, I, I actually don't really have a much experience with the oxygen ion conductors or an ion conductors. So I just wanted to know whether it's a big thing or not. Uh, uh, I, the people have looked at this in the past, uh, um, and I, I really have to go back to the literature. To, yeah. But, but <laughs> my, my memory is that, that that it wasn't found to be too important for the lithium conductors. Um, I know. I mean, I've worked on things like the lithium conduction in the perovskite lith lithium lanthanum titanate, mm -hmm. uh, and and there, um, yes, I think interaction between the two sublattices is quite important. And also um, uh, correlation effects between the moving lithium is, it, it, I, I think, I see, quite yeah, yeah. important uh, as well, uh, which is not so much not so important in in these vacancy diffusers, but might be important in the interstitial diffusers that uh, uh, Tatsumi Shihara was talking about. I see. Thanks for your answers. Aiz and Takaya. Hi. Right, can you hear me? Yes, I yes. can. Ah, thank you. Hi, thank you for wonderful talk. Hi, hi, John. Nice talking to you. And uh, I have a question regarding the strontium segregation. And the strontium seems to provide a weak ionic property in the perovskite structure in comparison with other bonds. And to prevent strontium segregation, should we select another atom which provides a larger covalent bond considering electronegativity as an indicator making covalent bonding? Um. The answer is yes, probably. I think that's that, that that's correct. The okay. thing about strontium, um, you know, that if if you like to go to back to hand waving arguments, mm -hmm. lanthanum on the B site mm -hmm. is one of the largest cations uh, on the A site. Sorry, is one of the largest cations. Mm -hmm. So putting lanthanum on the A site opens out the perovskite structure. Mm -hmm. You know that 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 little cartoon that I showed before. Yes, yes. Um, and it allows more space, if you like, free volume for the for the oxygen to migrate. So, mm -hmm. so most of these uh, materials are based on lanthanum on the A site. If you look at the solution energies, then the solution energy of strontium uh, substituting for lanthanum is the lowest of all the substituents that you can get. Mm -hmm. What that means is you can substitute to a high degree with strontium, mm -hmm. which you can't do with many of the other uh, uh, material. Oh. So you can substitute to a high degree, you get the high vacancy concentrations that oh. you need, but you pay the penalty, you then pay the penalty oh. of the strontium segregating out to the outer surface. Oh, I see. So, I mean, there are strategies that people have talked about, and Bill Gayilditz has talked about various strategies. One can uh, think about using invoking strain um, uh, to try and minimize the, the X solution of, 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 of the strontium. I see. I see. But yes, uh, you know, as in, in many of these cases, uh, 
uh, with one hand, you can improve the material, but ha that has a, a detrimental effect on the other hand. Mm -hmm. And it's balancing those to get the right answer. I think that's, that's uh, the trick. I see, I see. Thank you for answering. It was very interesting. Okay. Hey. Uh, Stefan, Professor Skinner. Morning, John. Oh, good morning, Stephen. <laughs> um, so I wonder if you could maybe give some comment on uh, the fact that all of the, the diffusion and surface exchange measurements that we do are all under ideal uh, gas atmospheres, right? So it's all dry oxygen. And of course, yeah. that's not the case in operating cells. So I wonder if you could, for the audience, comment on your thoughts regarding atmospheric impurities and how that actually impacts on diffusivity and surface exchange in operating materials rather than ideal devices? Yeah, uh, uh, another good question. And, and I'd thought about talking about this as well, but uh, you know, I could have talked for four hours and probably they want to go to bed in Japan. Um, yeah, uh, well, first of all, I mean, let's talk about the surface exchange coefficient. There have been numerous studies. Um, you've done some work. I've done some work at Eisner that show that when you introduce water vapor or, or uh, in fact, carbon dioxide into the exchanging gas atmosphere, then you uh, accelerate the effective K that you see. Uh, and the fact is that the um, uh, water molecule exchanges much faster than the, the dioxygen molecule. Uh, the dioxygen molecule is very tightly bound and breaking that bond is quite difficult, but uh, water is, 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 is e easier to dissociate. So the presence of water uh, will accelerate the surface exchange that we measure because the tracer can use the water as, um, what would you call it? Uh, uh, it's, a, it's not a catalyst, but it's a vehicle whereby it can exchange from the gas phase into the, into the, uh, into the solid by exchanging with the water molecule. Uh, and that we, we saw many years ago, but really didn't understand until, until recently. Um, the same happens with carbon dioxide, but you've got to remember that under operating conditions, if you have water in, in the uh, cathode compartment, you don't dissociate the water. You, you're, not, you're, not, you're not electrolyzing water in the cathode compartment. It's in fact exchanging faster, um, but it is blocking the exchange sites for the, for the dioxygen molecule. So in fact, it can have, uh, uh, um, uh, although we measure the tracer uh, coefficient as increasing, in fact, the real coefficient, that is of the dioxygen molecule exchanging with the surface has decreased because of this blocking effect. So it, it's quite a, a complex thing. Um, as to the diffusivity, well, we, uh, um, you know, you've shown that water can affect diffusivity in some of these materials. I think there's a, um, a number of effects going on there. One is that, that you affect the, the, the non-stoichiometry of, of the material. You can introduce uh, some uh, extra oxygen vacancies in as the effective PO2 goes down. Um, and the other is, I, I think that, that water will react with the grain boundaries. Um, I can't prove this at the moment, but uh, we, we do have some evidence that water penetrates down, down grain boundaries. I hope that answers your question. It was a bit of a, a complex answer. Yeah, no, I think that it was more for a case of uh, ex exposing it a little bit more to the, the more general audience and sort of thinking a little bit about uh, what, was in, what those factors are. So yeah, thanks, John. No, no, I, I agree. You know, it's very important. You, you start off with the idealized and then try to understand that and work into the more complex. But as I tried to show right at the beginning, you know, the opti you're trying to optimize a multi-component system with a very complex microstructure with lots of different interfaces in it. So it is a really very, very difficult optimization pro process. And when you start then thinking about 
um, what can happen in the gas phases, both in the fuel and in, 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 the, uh, in the cathode compartment, you really do have a, an extraordinarily complicated system. Okay. So, John, are you okay? I can find uh, another three questioners. Uh, can you accept yeah, all? Okay, so the next will be Koji, Professor Mezawa. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, John. Uh, this is hello. Mezawa from Tohoku. Hello, so, how are you? Very good to see you. I'm fine. <laughs> and uh, first of all, I, I should say thank you very much for very interesting talks. And actually, I have many, many questions because you gave us a lot of interesting topics. But what I was attracted most is uh, the surface screening phenomena when you're making the heterogeneous interface between the perovskite and the fluorite. So, so my question is, my, my first question is, what is the driving, and I was so surprised such a screening effect uh, happens in a very long distance from the interface. And uh, my first question is, uh, what is the driving force for such a long distance uh, cleaning? And uh, the second question is, what happens on the perovskite side? Yeah, uh, a very good question again. Um, uh, let me see if I, uh, if I can answer it. I, I think, you know, the, the answer to both questions is, is that the, the perovskite acts as a sink. I mean, the perovskite, is known as, as the chemical chameleon. Uh, you can fit virtually any ion in the periodic table on either the B or the A site. Okay. So it has the ability to accommodate a very large range of, of, of ions. And I think, you know, that has been the saving grace for the, for the fuel cell, because otherwise I think the surfaces of these perovskites would be covered in, in, in impurities. It's very common in YSZ to see silica on, on the surface. Uh, and the reason for that, of course, is, I mean, like all these uh, ceramic materials, they're derived from minerals and silica is a very ubiquitous um, uh, contaminant. Um, I think the, the, the driving force is, is, is just that, the, the, the perovskite acts as a strong sink Mm -hmm. uh, and at these higher temperatures, you know, the, the, the silicon is quite mobile across the surface. Okay, so that means, so probably you can clean the, uh, the surface of the floor light by the perovskite, but it might be difficult to clean the surface of the perovskite by the other oxide. Uh, well, yeah, I, I, it's a one-way effect. It's the perovskite is absorbing all these uh, uh, um, impurities. That's bad news. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. Yeah, it's bad news and good news. It keeps the perovskite surfaces clean, yeah. um, and it helps clean the other. I mean, um, Harry Tullis seen this on on um, Presidimium uh, Syria. Uh, in fact, it was with Sean Bishop. He came to us and, and, and they got some problems with looking at the surface exchange. And we suggested that, 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 that it, it, they may be able to gain some advantage from, from the cleaning effect. And, uh, and it seemed to work. They seemed to get a cleaner surface um, by, by having uh, a, a, um, a perovskite uh, uh, nearby. If I remember rightly, I just have to look up the paper and just get the, the, all the details. But it certainly, they, they invoke this cleaning effect in, in their experiments as well. Yeah, um, you know, it, 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 as I say, if, if it was just fluorite structured oxides, all the oxides that we've looked at with the uh, fluorite structure, when you look at the surfaces of Syria, again, they tend to be rather dirty. Um, uh, yttria stabilized zirconia is definitely always dirty. And there was an experiment done a long time ago at RISA, and this was a top Sims experiment. They annealed um, Tozo 8Y, looked at the surface, and it was covered with silica. They took it off um, and re annealed it, but they re annealed it in stages. And what they saw was the silica coming up the grain boundaries and across the surface, okay? So um, it's a continuous process. And I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, when you think about it, uh, to cover a surface, you need very little impurity. 
okay. to get a, 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 a you know a monolayer, a few monolayers. So so it's probably something that that that, that will be very difficult to stop it mm. totally. I see. Okay, thank you very much. I enjoyed your talk very much. Thank you, Koji. Thank you. So I'm uh, the next question for next question. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot. I'm not sure if I can read the name correctly, but Swan Si Nu Yen, please uh, make question. And Fan Tiu is the next questioner. Yes, uh, thank you. My name is T. Uh, sorry for the hard name to read. Uh, I'm sorry, too. <laughs> Uh, it's very nice to hear about your presentation. And I'm T, a master's student in Alex Lab, and I've heard from Alex about you a lot. And it's great to finally can see your presentation. Thank and you. uh, I just have a simple question that kind of adds up to what Takaya asked. Uh, I'm just wondering what is the driving force that uh, that keeps the grain boundary uh, that makes the grain boundaries keep pushing uh, strong tune to the surface. Mm. Yeah, so it's a, uh, it's a good question. Um, again, uh, I, I think the, you know, the, 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 the strong to anything that you put in the lattice is a disturbance to that lattice and, uh, and there will be some driving force for it to go uh, if he can to 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 move to to a surface or an interface, um, why why it it, it 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 has such a strong driving force at the moment? I, I, I can't really say, but um, we do know that if we if we leave the um, material for 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 long times, and I'll just see if I can. Get the right. Um, is it this one? Oh no, not that one. It was this one. This one here. Yeah. For instance, with these lanthanum strontium cobalt materials, uh, we saw not only was there a sort of a, a monolayer coating of strontium oxide, but the strontium oxide was beginning to to coalesce in, into particles. And we could see these particles on the surface with, with AFM. And in fact, if you look on the surfaces of most of these perovskite materials after high temperature annealing, you uh, will be able to see by SEM, if you look uh, uh, strongly enough, if you look carefully enough rather, that there, uh, there are formation of these uh, particles which can grow to be quite large particles of uh, strontium, we presume it's strontium oxide uh, on the surface of the of material. So it is a process that seems to continue via uh, the strontium coming up the grain boundaries, forming monolayers on the surface, and then this coalescing into, into particles. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, finally, I'd like to accept Quentin's Quentin question. Hi, John. How are you? Hi, Kwati. Very, very well, thank you. Uh, John, I mean, uh, thanks for uh, this uh, very interesting and really comprehensive talk. Uh, you have been talking about this uh, surface exchange and diffusion property and with dry action and uh, weight action and steam. What about with something that's CO2, and could you give us uh, some more common, I mean, it could be have a different mechanism react with the surface and then link to that kind of diversity of the material. For example, you mentioned you got a very strong uh, sonctian segregation. Then you supply with, react with the surface with the CO2. Then the sodium carbonate definitely form. Then what could yeah. be completely different things? There? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> right. Okay, Ting. I'll try and try and get, get an, an answer. An answer. Sorry, to okay. <laughs> now, I, I mean, there's there's quite a bit of evidence. Okay. If if you look back, let's just think about the carbon dioxide molecule itself. Um, and again. 
that we've done a little bit of work which which has not been published but uh, Eric Rachman did some some work some time ago where he was looking with uh, gas phase mass spectrometry and he saw the same sort of things that Stephen was talking uh, about in the oxygen exchange uh, or the tracer exchange is accelerated in the presence uh, of CO2. So again, it, 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 the CO2 molecule will exchange oxygen faster than, than, than the O2 molecule. Right. But you're, you're absolutely right, of course, when you have the surface covered in, in strontium, you will get carbonate formation. Uh, and, and we do see carbonates on the surfaces uh, of, of these materials. Um, also, you know, it, if you're thinking about a, a real environment, you'd have both oxygen and uh, um, uh, 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 carbon dioxide. Yeah, carbon dioxide. And, yeah I, and, and there is a, a really nice result that was published from Ulich. Again, you know, it's back in the old literature, which I think all you young people have to read because <laughs> there's a lot of information there. A lot has been done. Some of it is not as well known as, as, as it should be. What, what they did was they, they took um, a, a CGO sample. I hope you can see, I hope I'm visible. A CGO sample, they put an LSCF, um, I think it was an LSCF, but it was certainly a strontium containing electrode on the top and put the cell and the gas flow was in this direction okay and okay. what they then did was sims depth profiling off the electrode onto the bare seria okay so they tracked across so this is downstream on the bare seria the electrode is here and you're downstream and what they saw was strontium was transported all the way down on the downstream uh, uh, of the uh, of the air electrode, right. and they said, "Well, we believe this is uh, formed by uh, uh, is caused by the formation of these volatile oxyhydroxides of strontium, uh -huh. which <laughs> evaporate off the surface and they're transported down." And you know, a lot of fuel cell engineers tell you that if you look on the downstream side of the the cathode, you you'll see a lot of strontium. It's transported out of the out of the cathode, which is bad news. It's transported long distances, and it can be by these gas phase uh, uh, um, components. Yeah, exactly. It's on the surface, but it's, the material is works. So it's just something interesting. The mechanism there, it could be. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there may be some more questions, but time is already uh, exceeding. Uh, so I'd like to close the, this meet, this seminar right now. Uh, but before that, I'd like to thank John again, and I'd like uh, for a very nice talk and very it is it is very productive and informative talk. So now I'd like to close this seminar. So I'd like to ask, uh, thank all the speakers, uh, sorry, all, all the audience, and I'd like to join again. Thank you very much. And John, have a nice day. Thank you very much. I think it's time thank for you. a cup of coffee thank now. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Yes, yes, you need okay. a coffee. Yes. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Goodbye, goodbye everyone. Bye. Bye. John, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.